جی السلام علیکم ناظرین نصیر ملک از ہیئر ود دا پروگرام ڈسیژن ٹائم ایز یوژول تو آج کا جو پروگرام ہے اس میں آئی ایم سوری آئی ول ناٹ بی ایبل ٹو گیو یو دا کرنٹ سچویشن جو میں ایوری ویک اپنے پروگرام میں ڈسکس کرتا ہوں پاکستان کے بارے میں تو آج ٹائم کی بھی ذرا شارٹیج ہے اور دوسرے جو میرے پاس گیسٹ ہیں دا اسٹوڈیو ان سے آئی ہیو ٹو ڈسکس آن کوئی لاٹ آف ایشوز اینڈ آپ کو پتہ ہی ہے جیسا کہ ہم ڈسکس کر رہے ہیں لاسٹ ٹو تھری پروگرامز برادری ازم بریڈ فوڈ ویسٹ اسلامو فوبیا اینڈ دیر سو مینی تھنگس ٹو ڈسکس ود مائی گیسٹ ٹوڈے ان دا اسٹوڈیو آئی ہیو مسٹر جارج گلوے ویلکم ٹو یو مسٹر جارج گلوے وعلیکم السلام تھینک یو ویری مچ فار یور ٹائم ٹوڈے ان اے شارٹ نوٹس از ویل Uh, hi, Mr. George Gill, I'll just go to straight. I've got, I've got a quite a few things to discuss with you. Sure. Uh, I would start straight away from the Kashmir issue. Uh, you have aggressively been working on Palestine issue. Uh, you voted against the military force overseas. Uh, that's always. Mm. Could you please tell us if you have done any, th- any work on Kashmir issue? Uh, majority of your constituents are from Pakistan, Azad Kashmir. Um, all figures showing there has been an ongoing use of extra violence against the people of Indian control Kashmir? Please. Indeed, uh, this is the insult that's added to the injury suffered by the people of occupied Jammu and Kashmir that very few people know about it. Uh, most people in Britain think Kashmir is a sweater or a cardigan. Uh, very few people in this country are aware that a hundred thousand people have lost their lives uh, in the last 30 years uh, as a result of their demand for the implementation of a United Nations resolution to grant them self-determination for the right to put an X on a piece of paper. It doesn't seem like too much of an ask and yet uh, getting the issue into the news onto the news agenda, onto the political agenda has been extraordinarily difficult for a number of reasons, not all of them to be laid at the door of the British political class and media, but much of it uh, to be there. I've been fighting this cause for almost 40 years, in fact. I was the general secretary of the National Lobby on Kashmir, which had fantastic success in the 1990s. Uh, I uh, organized the National Lobby of Parliament. 7,000 people came from all over the country to lobby their member of parliament at Westminster. I took a whole train full through to Brussels to lobby the European Parliament. And most importantly, we succeeded in winning the Labour Party conference to a pro-Kashmir position, an anti-Indian position, as it was described by the then Indian government. And some of your viewers may recall there was a diplomatic uh, uh, brouhaha over uh, the uh, Queen's visit to India with the late Robin Cook because we had just passed this resolution held to be anti-Indian and uh, the late Robin Cook was accused of embarrassing the Queen uh, as a result. This all collapsed as a result of internal machinations inside Pakistan after the defenestration of the late Benazir Bhutto and subsequent events. Don't have time to go into them all. But the fact that the biggest concentration of military occupation power on the earth is on the ground in occupied Kashmir, 500,000 Indian soldiers subjecting the local population to mass repression, murder, disappearance, torture, imprisonment and even rape as a weapon of political intimidation is uh, one of the great scandals in the world today Uh, and uh, the great tragedy to be added to that is as I say that we can't get the British media even to cover it. It's difficult to cover because the Indian occupation regime doesn't allow journalists freely to go there. I myself am banned from entering any part of India. You have tried? Yes, uh, repeatedly. Uh, mm. But I was, I was, they attempted to blackmail me the last time. I was to go to uh, a conference entirely unrelated to Kashmir, uh, a big international conference. When I applied for my visa, my wife got one and uh, mine was left 
on the table. And finally, they asked me to sign a disavowal of the Kashmir cause. And if I did, I'd get my passport back with a visa in it. Of course, I refused. They gave me the passport back, no visa, and wouldn't even return the 90 pounds or so that I'd paid for the no. visa. So the Indian government still owes me that money and I intend to try and get it. Uh, we're doing everything we can. We've had a debate in Parliament recently. We had a huge petition. Uh, inch by inch, we have to get understanding of the Kashmir issue as high in this country as the Palestinian issue is. Now that ought to be doable because, as you implied, there are hundreds of thousands of people of Kashmiri origin in Britain. Do that ought to be the bedrock. Yeah. But they would have to find some unity oh. amongst themselves. Yeah, sorry, themselves I'm, I'm just, just, just a related question here. Mm. <clears throat> Do you believe the Kashmiri um, organizations here living in, in this country are effectively uh, um, um, uh, bringing these issues on the um, uh, platform? Well, not effectively enough. On the political enough, platform. Not effectively enough, evidently, yeah. or we'd be further forward. It's not that they don't work hard. They work fantastically hard. Uh, they are forever convening meetings and rallies and uh, activities of all kinds. But it's clearly not enough. Uh, and I identify the principal problem as being a lack of unity, a lack of focus. You know, I was a veteran of the struggle for freedom in South Africa. There were many things wrong with the freedom struggle in South Africa. But the one thing that they had that was entirely correct was one leadership, one address. And if you have that, you are off to a flying start. Uh, the Kashmiris don't have that, and I think they suffer as a result. Right. <clears throat> when we look at that army chief visit to uh, Britain recently, uh, he says there will be no peace between two nuclear nations without resolving the Kashmir issue. Do you believe it's time for the international powers to play their role, particularly Britain? Well, long past uh, their time. Uh, this uh, extant uh, uh, UN Security Council resolution is uh, well over half a century old, and yet it has never been uh, implemented. It's gathered several inches of dust on the shelves. So it's well past time for the powers to occupy themselves with this. After all, it's a very dangerous situation in a very sensitive geopolitical part of the world. Two nuclear armed states are at daggers drawn, you could say nuclear daggers drawn with each other, over an unresolved issue, which can be resolved merely by the placing of an X on a piece of paper. As I said earlier, it's not much of an ask. It's not like the Palestine question where you would have to uproot the Zionist settlers from the occupied land. Uh, it, the, 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 the land and the people are one. Uh, all they demand is the right to choose their own self-determination. So it's long past time. It's not happening. I mean, if you, you just mentioned settlers, uh, I've got a news here that there is some news coming. <clears throat> Mr. Modi government has planned and may have already started <clears throat> shifting settlers in Indian, uh, Indian control Kashmir. Mm. Well, there's nothing... Uh, beyond Mr. Modi. He's a highly dangerous man with a very sectarian turn of mind uh, and a lot of blood on his hands. So it wouldn't surprise me if they did attempt what Israel has done uh, of, of supplanting local people with settlers who are foreign to the land, have nothing to do with that land, uh, and will then be into an even more dangerous situation. So I hope that he doesn't do that. Uh, I mean, if, if, if they exercise and the, then the shift, the, the population balance change shifts. Change the demography, yeah. Right, so what would happen then? Uh, uh, well, this is what Israel has attempted to do. Yeah. It failed in Palestine. It would fail <coughs> in occupied Kashmir. But the very act of trying, no doubt under some guidance from Israel, with whom Mr. Modi is closely allied, uh, would, be, would make a dangerous situation even more incendiary. So the international community needs to do much more before the things get worse. Yes, or, or they may wake up to find that, uh, that war, full scale yeah. war, has broken out. Mm -hmm. 
between India and Pakistan with the danger of nuclear exchange. Already, as it is, there are the, the both countries, the tensions always on the borders, mm. and that the revenue they're spending on the weapons on the both sides is huge. Yeah. That could be spent on the population. Of course. I think 40% of the budget of yeah. each country is being yeah. spent on the military. If you add the percentage that's being spent on debt repayment, and interest payments, and so on, it doesn't leave much for any government to actually change the realities on the, on the ground in either country. And at the same time, losing lots of soldiers there as well. Yes, this is a basically yeah. decades of attrition. Uh, but as we've learned elsewhere, in the Ukraine, for example, uh, attrition can quickly become much more than that. It can become a full-scale conflagration. And in this case, between two, two nuclear armed powers, and in, in, in disputed Kashmir, uh, Indian controlled Kashmir, uh, there is uh, there is a huge army there, and uh, the figures, Kashmir organizations figures, I've got it here. Um, uh, this says there is uh, there is uh, uh, one soldier for ten people there. Well, that must be true. Five hundred thousand uh, Indian soldiers. That's a million boots on the ground, uh, and yeah. ready to be reinforced at any time and conducting a reign of terror. There is a reign of terror in occupied Kashmir. I'm not exaggerating. A hundred thousand people have lost their lives. Uh, this is a river of blood, a raging river of blood. And of course, every one of those martyrs has a family and then a wider family bent upon uh, honoring the martyrs. You have the recipe for endless conflict. And of course, as again we found in the Palestine question, when you reach a certain level of sacrifice, first of all, more and more people are ready to continue the sacrifice. But uh, secondly, you've paid so much in blood for your freedom struggle that it would be to dishonor the martyrs and the victims to give it up. So there's no chance. I say this to India, whom I wish well. I have nothing against the uh, great nation of India, uh, you will never solve this problem yeah. because the people have paid too much, too high a price, mm. now to give up their Rather struggle. Rather, if you should be de de uh, solve the issue, so, well, so, so the neighboring countries, <coughs> both neighboring countries can live together. Uh, we need them. a vote. Yeah. There's no, if Scotland can have a referendum yeah. on why its self-determination, yeah. yeah. why can't the people of Kashmir? East Timor can have a referendum. Well, East Timor became an independent yeah. state as a result of yeah. putting an X on a ballot paper. Mm -hmm. Scotland could have, but didn't, become an independent state by putting an X on the ballot paper. That's all the people of the occupied land are asking for. Right, we're moving on to... Uh, Right, I think I've been asked to take a break here. Okay. Right, <clears throat> we'll break. Uh, we'll take a short break here. When we come back uh, from the break, we'll carry on with uh, Mr. George Galway. Thank you very much, and we'll see you right after the break. Assalamu alaikum Nazreen, welcome you back after the break. Uh, Mr. Jaj Galve, I've got a lot of people, uh, they understand Urdu. Can we carry on in Urdu? Uh, no, but we can <laughs> speak in Arabic if you'd like. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, let's carry on then. <clears throat> MPs with the highest outside earnings mm. are less active in the parliament. Mm. The study finds, uh, if you allow me, could you just read that? Of course, yes, bit? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Members of parliament who earn the most from a second job speak less in the parliament debates, uh, subject fever written questions and uh, miss more votes than other MPs, uh, according to the research by a Labour Party. And then I'll go next to that. Mm, the research comes after the Labour, Labour leader Ed Miliband called for a ban on MP holding uh, directorship and uh, consultancies. Um, and a cap on MPs earning from second job. Labour is expected to include the ban on MPs' second job in uh, its election manifesto. How do you see that? Well, I have several uh, television jobs, uh, and they're all about politics. Uh, so I don't regard my activities outside of Parliament as a second job because I only have one job, and that's politics. I present political television programs. I make political films. 
like the forthcoming one on, on Tony Blair, which uh, will be out soon, and I think people will be queuing in Bradford and elsewhere to see it. Uh, so unlike Jack Straw and Malcolm Rifkin and many other MPs, it would appear, I'm not touting for work which is entirely unrelated to my politics. I'm not in business in any way. I'm not a consultant uh, in any way. And just to disprove your figures, I have uh, brought more issues up in Parliament than any other MP in the whole of Britain. In fact, I brought more issues before the Parliament than all the Bradford MPs put together. And there's four other MPs in Bradford, though not a lot of people know that. Uh, so uh, it's not the case, because my television programmes take one hour to present, uh, or in some cases half an hour uh, to present. Uh, it's not the case that I'm doing less parliamentary work as a result. Uh, on the contrary, I'm the hardest working MP in Britain, if you measure that by the, frankly, bewildering range of issues from the local to the national to the international mm -hmm. that I bring before the British House of Commons. So do you believe it should not be banned? Uh, well, it depends what <coughs> they mean by other jobs. Yeah. My case will be uh, writing political articles, making political television programs. It's not another job. Uh, the including course, consultancies there. Uh, yeah, I think uh, people should not be in business and be in Parliament. I mean, if I were selling, you know, eggs uh, or uh, furniture or cars, that would be an entirely unrelated business activity and I shouldn't be allowed to do it. But uh, nobody's going to stop me uh, presenting political television shows. Right. <clears throat> it looks like a win-win situation for you. Uh, have you done any sort of deal with the Labour's? There is some rumours there as well, particularly in Bradford. Well, there are always rumours in Bradford, uh, <laughs> and indeed rumours in politics uh, generally, but uh, unequivocally and absolutely not. Uh, I have never had a conversation with Labour about Bradford, neither with the local uh, political leaders nor with the national. How do I have you no need of a deal, by the way. Right. I, I, there I, there I is no deal. I then. think I'm going to win <laughs> without no. any deal. Right. Um, how do you look at the labour handling of Bradford West? Uh, first, there was a, uh, first, there was a big, long delay uh, choosing the candidate. Then they brought Amina Ali from outside, from London, and uh, she refused to contest. And at the last, um, uh, picking up a least uh, voted candidate, in the party, yeah. that's according to their own party Their members. own figures, yeah. Their, their own mm -hmm. figures, at least. Uh, how do you see that, you know? Well, uh, I mean, on a, from a personal point of view, I'm very happy about it. The Labour Party is in complete disarray, not in any position to fight an election against me. Uh, so, personally, that's good. Uh, but from the point of view of Labour, for which I care, and from the point of view of Bradford, for which I care even more, it's not a good situation. Uh, they have had three years to sort out the Labour Party in Bradford since I delivered the crushing defeat to them in the by-election of 2012. Uh, but they haven't done anything and they have only appointed this second candidate against me in the last few days. And she, as you say, came bottom of the poll when the members chose the first candidate who then walked out after three days. So they're in a terrible uh, mess. Now, as you know, I'm a real Labour man. I want Labour to win the general election. I, I want the Tories out. So it follows that on the bigger level, uh, I don't want Labour to be a mess. But in Bradford, I'm afraid it is a mess. If, if there is old Labour, would you go back to Labour? Sure, if Labour was Labour again, I would, of course, go back. As most people on the left who've mm departed from the Labour Party since the Iraq War in particular uh, would also do, uh, but they'll have to do rather more than they've done so far to rebrand themselves again as a real Labour Party. I mean, for example, they have just accepted £106,000 from Tony Blair. This is blood money. It's soaked in the blood of people all over the world and they've accepted it. This is insanity. They should be putting as much distance as they possibly can 
between themselves and Tony Blair, Alastair Campbell, and so on. Instead, they're in, still in bed with these people and taking their money. So as long as that situation exists, uh, people like me could never go back to the Labour Party and will continue to struggle to recreate a real Labour Party. And that's what we've been doing. <clears throat> Very briefly on this, uh, why, why do you have a candidate in Bradford East? Because we're concentrating on holding Bradford West. Uh, we are a small party with no appreciable financial you had a very resources. good uh, you, you had the large popularity in uh, Bradford yes in but, Bradford, uh, by elections. but uh, yes but a general election is very different you know mm -hmm. the people will be watching television every night where the battle will be labor versus conservative it's a big struggle in a, a parliamentary election to make a micro climate to say that's all very well elsewhere but in Bradford West it's a different contest. I'm confident that we can do it. Uh, of course, it's not certain that we won't have a candidate in Bradford East. We don't have to decide that for another three weeks. And we have explored it. And we've explored uh, Halifax. We've explored Keithley uh, and so on. We, we have many candidates in the country from the south coast to the north of England. And we're not yet at the end of that selection uh, process. But in Bradford, I rather think that we will concentrate not just on defending my seat, but on winning a raft of council elections in the constituency and beyond. <clears throat> well, going to, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to uh, Bradford West. Uh, you said to Fatima uh, from Asian Sunday newspaper um, that Bradford West is one of the poorest constituency. Mm. Can you please elaborate on that? Uh, why do you believe so? <clears throat> and that's just a connected question. Why, uh, what, what are the reasons? Well, the reasons are the decline of Bradford economically over the best part of 100 years. In, in, in 1901, so 114 years ago, Bradford was the richest city in England, had more multi-millionaires per head of the population than any other, even London. Uh, but that's when we had an industrial base that has now almost entirely disappeared. And many of the jobs which the immigrant population came from Mirpur, uh, the broader Azad Kashmir, Pakistan generally, many of the jobs that they came for no longer exist. And their children and their children and their children have been born in the interim. In fact, Bradford is the youngest city in Europe, can you imagine? By 2020, 50% of the people of Bradford will be under the age of 25, which ought to be a godsend, ought to be a real blessing, but if the young people have no work, no money, it could be the reverse. And secondly, Bradford has been politically mismanaged for more than 40 years. Let me come back to that, Mr. Yes. Let me just I need mm. to go for a break, ah, Mr. Yes. George. Okay. Right. <clears throat> right, Nazreen, we'll, we'll just take a sharp break here. When we come back <clears throat> from break, we'll be carry on talking on Bradford just a little, little bit more, and then we'll be moving on to the other issue, <clears throat> and we'll see you shortly after the break. Yes, Assalamu alaikum Nazim. welcome you back after the break. So, um, <clears throat> we're just talking to uh, Mr. George Galway on the, uh, on the Bradford West. I'll just carry on a little bit more on Bradford, uh, maybe, maybe just quickly, maybe about five minutes, and then we'll move on to the other issues. Um, right, there has been a lot of problems in Bradford, mm. and I'll, I'll be coming to uh, later on in the program, maybe a couple of issues. How can we fix it? I mean, I mean you yourself. Well, we have to change the political class. Yeah. Uh, Bradford has been mismanaged by all three major parties. Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrats have all run Bradford over the last 40 years. In the 1960s, Leeds and Bradford were entirely comparable cities in every way. Now Leeds is booming and Bradford has been until recently sinking, literally so into the hole in the city centre that uh, Westfield was supposed to be in. Uh, it is beginning to pick up in the three years that I've been there. Uh, the Westfield is now emerging from that hole and will be open soon, creating jobs and footfall and drawing people into the city. 
The Odeon, which was crumbling and falling down when I arrived there, has now been saved and we've got millions of pounds from the government to kickstart its renovation. The National Media Museum, which the government announced they were going to close, has been saved in a campaign led by me. Uh, and the campaign on Bradford schools is reaching uh, now a critical mass. We have the second poorest schools in all of England, and we have in one ward, Little Horton in the city, the highest number of children living in poverty in all of England. So the education challenge, the Bradford challenge, which I have been <coughs> advocating as a lone voice for three years, mm -hmm. has now been adopted I'm, I'm by, the other, I'm by coming, the other parties. Yeah, I'm coming to that, Mr. George. Mm. There, is, there, is, there are some terrifying figures there, mm. there about the crimes and about the mm -hmm. educations and, and a couple of other things. <clears throat> Going to the visit, you know, when, when I'm speaking to the candidates and uh, we want these, these some issues that the Pakistani community particularly is facing, like visit visas and uh, the spouse visa and those things. I want to discuss those as well with you. And the threat <clears throat> to halal, don't forget the, that. The, the, to halal, yeah. I'll be coming to that as well. So visit visa, when we talk on that, Mr. George Gale, half of our families are living in Pakistan, as you know. <clears throat> they have to visit us, um, and we have to visit them on the occasions like weddings and funerals and everything. <clears throat> we can't just possibly disconnect with them. At the current situation, when you're looking at it, like from, I'll just give one example from your own constituency, right? <clears throat> a family continue fighting for a wife right to visit Bradford man who was critically injured in attack. Mm. I won't go into the uh, details of this. I, I'm, the, I'm the one who raised this. Uh, are, are you issue. working on that? Yes, I'm the one who raised this issue. This was a man putting down the shutter on his store in Halifax, but a resident of Bradford who was savagely assaulted, was in a, a, a coma, and the visa application of his wife to visit him in hospital was refused. I had it on the front page of the Telegraph and Argus, the local newspaper, and this typified the absolutely monstrously insensitive racist nature of our immigration policy. I promise you this, if the man had been uh, an American and his wife was an American, she would have been here good. before you could say yeah. Jack Robinson. Uh, but the departure point of our immigration system is one of absolute suspicion and cynicism, how to keep as many people out as possible. And uh, I don't know if you want me to mention now the so-called bride uh, price, where a person has to show earnings, show being the operative word, I'll be coming of 18,600 pounds yeah, yeah. in order to get a wife of their yeah. choice. Yeah. This is discrimination not just on grounds of race but on grounds of class. Yeah. And, and when you're looking at Mr. J, in this particular case, like that the surety is being given by his uncle and mm. that is his uh, uh, is 40,000 pound mm -hmm. and they, they, they said they will comply with all the restrictions whatever they, the immigration wants mm -hmm. to put mm -hmm. but they want the wife to come and visit him mm -hmm. in this critical situation mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. he is now. Well it's, it's simply monstrous. Uh, the uncle came to my constituency surgery which I hold every Saturday morning uh, with this case and I, I had to sort of look behind to see if he was pulling my leg. It's such a monstrosity of a story it's almost difficult to believe that it's true, but it was true. And uh, we raised hell in Parliament about this. And it's not actually, sadly, uh, all that unusual. It's more extreme than many other cases, but there are many other cases. It's discrimination. It's discrimination on the grounds of color, race, nationality, and as I've said on the bride price, even of class. I myself have a wife who has an Indonesian passport. I have no difficulty showing 18,600 pounds, and my wife was in here just like that. But I have, of course, most of my caseload is immigration related, uh, as indeed it was in my previous constituencies. Uh, so I'm a pretty expert on the immigration system. I'm on first name terms with the guards at Heathrow and Gatwick who charged with uh, ferrying people out. Uh, when they get a call from me on a Saturday evening, their heart sinks because they know 
if I'm on the case, they're going to have to argue pretty hard. <clears throat> well, I was, uh, when I updated the status on, on the social media, and I asked the community to, if, if they like to, you know, participate in there, and if you want to say something about the uh, visit visa and uh, uh, the spouse visa, I received this email, and I mean, could, is it okay if I can just read that quickly? Yes. Right. <clears throat> I applied, this gentleman, he says, I applied for a visit visa in Pakistan, but it was refused. My wife is accept, expecting a baby very soon. I sponsored my parents, um, I sponsored my parents, and in my sponsorship letter, I clearly mentioned I will bear all the expenses, including boarding and living in London. I showed £10,000 in his account, and I am working on, the, uh, on a good, uh, good consultancy firm, and my earning is £4,000 before, uh, uh, before tax a month. Um, but my parents were refused. My father is a retired person, a retired army person from Pakistan, an army person that only can get £100 a month pension. Now, what I supposed to do? Uh, isn't it totally injustice, unfair on all of all of us, myself, my children, and my parents? I consider this is a violation of basic human it rights is, it is. Uh, for a British citizen. It is, and every citizen has the right to a family life that's enshrined in the uh, European uh, law. It, it is enshrined in any moral code. Uh, we have a right to be visited by our elderly parents or by our uh, siblings or cousins. Uh, of course, the state has a right to regulate who comes in and who goes out, but it must do so on a, a basis that is not discriminatory. And these immigration rules are manifestly discriminatory, both on race and class. I mean, you, you can put some sort of a mechanism there. Um, you've got a people sitting in the immigration. They can, you can come up with some sort of solid uh, uh, mechanism so the people come and the guarantee they'll go. Well, but they will be going back. Uh, the elderly people, uh, the, the somebody 72 years, what would he do? And he'll just come uh, well, to see his family. Uh, and go let's back. go back to the man who was assaulted. Yeah. His uncle was ready to put £40,000 down as a bond that the man's wife would not seek to overstay. And this was refused. This is madness. And of course, when you factor in other things like foreign students now being restricted, cut back, witch hunted, this is all part of an anti-immigrant racist atmosphere being generated in this country by right-wing politicians, sometimes with, I'm sorry to say, labor collusion, uh, and by the yellow media that we have that will plaster a negative story about people of color, principally about Muslims, uh, all over their front pages. Uh, and so we, we live in uh, very difficult times. I've been dealing with immigration cases for now almost 30 years. I've been in parliament almost 30 years. Uh, and once upon a time, I could go up and buttonhole a minister, uh, browbeat that minister on a case and solve it. Now the minister just says, well, it's nothing to do with me, it's the agency, the privatized agency. Once upon a time, I could contact the uh, high commission or embassy in this or that country, get right through to the ambassador, put pressure on them on a particular case. Now they refer me to uh, Dubai, uh, where decisions are being made by people who are not even civil servants. They have deliberately distanced themselves precisely to protect themselves against democratic pressure to behave as decent uh, um, administrators. It's entirely inhuman, dehumanized and dehumanizing. <clears throat> Is this the right way of uh, controlling immigration? No, it's entirely not. Uh, and of course, the reality is that immigration for Britain has been a tremendous success story in every regard. In the economic regard, immigrants work harder generate more wealth, five billion pounds a year more wealth than they take out in benefits and public services, but not just in economic. I lived in Britain when it was a monocultural, all-white uh, country. And believe me, today's Britain is much better. Uh, once upon a time, all the food and choice that we have, the music, the culture, uh, the wonderful Multicultural. We're sitting here in London, one of the most multicultural cities on the earth. 
where 53% of the population uh, are from outside of this country. And it's a joy to behold. Across the road is a Lebanese, next to it is a Greek, next to it is a Turkish. Up the road is one of the best Chinese restaurants uh, in London and so on. This is something to celebrate, not curse and see what we can do to keep as many of these people out, not let them bring the bride of their choice, uh, refuse their parents the right to visit them. This is simply racist and monstrous. I mean, <clears throat> and you have um, elected again. Would you be just carry, carrying on these issues? You know, oh, this, sure. This uh, way, particularly 18,600 ban this, is in York, particularly in the in the north. It's very hard for people where the earning it's isn't, very hard isn't the figure. In figure I, I, I don't have much time. You know very well yourself. Yeah, the, the figure shows that more less than a fifty more than fifty percent people are not onto that no, level can't. of eight. So what are they supposed to do? Are, yeah, they are they supposed not supposed to get married? Yeah. Are they yeah. supposed to marry someone not of their yeah. choice? Yeah. Uh, are they supposed to go through life without issue, without children? Because they couldn't show on paper that they earned eighteen point six. I had a man last Saturday at my surgery who could show that he made eighteen point seven and they still refused them. Yes, there are several cases. There are several, yeah. several girls are stopped there. Several boys are stopped there in Pakistan. Let, we move on to the next one. Mm. Uh, let's do a fast forward a bit. Uh, what do you say on freedom of speech um, going back to Charlie Hebdo in Syria? Well, there are real restrictions to freedom of speech, and there should be. Uh, I may not, on your show, libel anyone, defame anyone. Uh, and if I did, I'd be in serious legal trouble, and so would you. Uh, so that's a restriction on my freedom of speech. Uh, I may not on your show or on a platform or anywhere in public uh, incite hatred uh, of other races. That would be illegal and rightly so. And I'd be put in prison for doing it. That's a restriction on freedom of speech. In many countries in Europe, again, in my view, rightly so, it is illegal to deny the Holocaust suffered by many people, but principally the Jewish people in the 1930s and 40s. It's illegal to question that, to deny it. Rightly so, it should be illegal here in Britain to do so, although it isn't. Neither is it in the United States. So that's a restriction on freedom of speech. The one area where freedom of speech is apparently limitless is the freedom to insult Muslims, the freedom to generate and incite hatred of Muslims, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on Islam as a religion. There you're perfectly free to speak as freely as you would like. And I say that's not right, that's not fair, that's not just. But worse than that, it's not clever to do so because it has consequences. If I shouted fire in a darkened cinema, making the people stampede, and kill each other as they scrambled to the door, my freedom of speech to shout fire would quickly be trumped by the right to live of the people in that darkened cinema. Uh, and yet we are allowing people to outdo each other in incitement of hatred of Islam and of Muslims. I need to go for a break, short break here, uh, Mr. Jordan. We'll come back and we'll carry on on that. A little bit more on Islamophobia. <clears throat> the Nazim will just go for a quick break here. The break, so we'll, when we come back from the break, <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll just go on a little bit on the Islamophobia as well. And then I've got quite a few other issues. And uh, let's take a quick break and we'll uh, see you shortly after the break. Assalamu alaikum Nazreen, uh, welcome you back after the break. Uh, uh, before the break we were talking on the freedom of speech, we'll carry on on that and we'll go into the f Islamophobia. Uh, mm. Mr. George Galway, Islamophobia is on the rise. Um, every day uh, materials about Islam in, uh, printed everywhere um, in the world, not just in the Europe and in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, how are you looking at this, 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 this situation where, where so many people are upset, uh, Muslims are upset mm. around the world, and particularly the Muslim living in the West? Well, it's not just words, of course, though words can be very hurtful and very insightful. Uh, it's uh, actions. Uh, it starts with hate speech. Heart starts with hate journalism and ends in blood on the streets. 
uh, attacks on mosques, attacks on Muslims on their way to and from mosques, attacks on Sikhs who are thought to be Muslims by the ignorant uh, racists who engage in this kind of behavior. And of course it has consequences the other way. The atmosphere that we have and the foreign policy that we pursue plus the existence amongst the Ummah of some small number of extremists leads to catastrophe elsewhere. Uh, the recent case uh, of uh, the so-called jihadi John uh, cutting off people's heads uh, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, so there's real blood comes from this atmosphere and if we don't get off this escalator of conflict then we're going to be in deeper and deeper trouble and I, I often say we have to try and take the hate out of this situation. We have to stop doing what we're doing if we're going to reverse the trend of fanaticization and extremization that undoubtedly has occurred. Three girls from my old constituency in Bethnal Green in East London recently ran away to join this so-called ISIS in Syria. And most probably, God forbid, these girls are already married off to some jihadist there. And la samahallah, God forbid, they may be killed in, a, in an airstrike or in the fighting that is intensifying in Syria and in Iraq. So there are real consequences uh, to people's lives, let alone the lives of their families that they leave behind. This Islamophobia is the last respectable form of racism. The, the Times, for example, ran a front page story last week which talked about Muslim grooming. What does Muslim have to do with grooming? Nothing. It's a social, social uh, evil. Grooming yeah. is, first of all, yeah. mainly carried out yeah. by non-Muslim white people. But insofar as men who were Muslims were grooming, they were not grooming as Muslims. Yeah. They were, this is utterly against all the principles of Islam. Nothing in Islam. It's got nothing to do with the Islam. But this it's is a social the, evil. On the and front it has, page yeah. of the paper of record, the Times, one of the oldest, most venerable newspaper titles in the entire world. And yet that's what they had on their front page. So this why is, is not... Uh, becoming why, a hysteria. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Jajgil, why is not being addressed on a social platform rather than calling them a Muslim? Because it's social evil and it exists in every society, every culture. And why is it related? Well, is Jimmy related Savile Muslims? was not uh, Muhammad Savile. Cyril Smith was not Ali Smith. Uh, all these people, who uh, Gary Glitter, uh, was not Ahmed Glitter. These are typical of the vast majority of sexual abuse of children in Britain is not carried out by Muslims. Yet, in the public's mind, this synonym of Muslim equals child abuser has been established by the popular media, by the hysterical anti-Muslim prejudice in the country. I would like to share this, uh, mm. this, this news the Telegraph says uh, that's a couple of weeks back and today I was just, uh, I've, I've had this, uh, the news.co.uk, that magazine is just, just over there, right, they, they write something on that same as well. Uh, do you worry about uh, Britain growing Muslim population? And you are not alone, according to the British uh, Social Attitude BSA survey in 2003, 48% um, of Britons worried in an increase in the Muslim population. Mm -hmm. And that's this, this, that, that puts in the bracket today um, on, on the 7th of their edition, 7th of, uh, 7th of March. And this is um, putting in the bracket population that is a Muslim population that is expected to double by 2030 thanks to immigration and a high birth rate. How do you see that? Well, alhamdulillah, the Muslim population in Britain is growing. It's grown by 1 million in 10 years. Uh, so it will not be doubling in 15 years. This is a statistical falsehood that the Daily Telegraph have practiced upon their uh, readers, uh, for that matter, according to the recently resigned Star Reporter. Uh, but the 
Muslim population is increasing mainly because Muslims have children and they have on average more children than non-Muslims. This is a wonderful thing. We desperately need more young people in Britain. We have an aging population uh, and that aging population will not be able to be sustained unless we have new blood. So thank God, hallelujah, for uh, the birth rate of Britain's Muslims. Very few Muslims are coming here as immigrants because, as we've just been discussing, yes, yeah. of discriminatory immigration policies. Most of the immigrants coming into Britain are Roman Catholics, are Christians from Eastern Central Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, so this hysteria is based on falsehood. And moreover, why would you be worried about the existence of 2.7 million God, largely God-fearing people in your midst. What's wrong with Muslims? Are they not family people? Are they not religious believers? Do they not live their lives according to the commandments which are common to all three of the monotheistic uh, faiths? The answer to that question is color prejudice. You see, if all the Muslims were white Muslims, this issue would not be uh, as sharp as it is. It's really about race. Of course, there are white Muslims, but 95% or more of Muslims in Britain uh, look like you rather than me. And it's people who hate people who look like you who use their hatred of Islam as a stick to beat the immigrants uh, with. Which leads me to my second point. Most of them are not immigrants at all. Uh, no, I'm not an your, immigrant anymore. Your sons uh, are not immigrants. Yeah. They're as British as me or any other person mm -hmm. who was born here. They so, just have a, a different skin color, that's all. It seems like, and the feedback we received, it seems like you're creating more fear for Muslim than, uh, than the other way around because the children over here are born British and they are British. You know, they are British, they, to go they have the work? same rights as any other Britisher or as few rights as mm. any other uh, Britisher, no more, no less. And to describe them as immigrants mm. is false. And to, to cloak or dress up prejudice against them as being prejudiced against a religion rather than a race is because prejudice against a race is illegal and prejudice against a religion is not. Just going back to uh, your constitution, going back to Bradford mm. again, uh, poor schooling, as we mentioned earlier as well. Uh, Bradford mm. has got a result. We just got the results as well, the second worst in the country, right? <clears throat> what do you uh, what do you have to say on that? that? Just a quick one, and then how could it be fixed? You know, how could it bring the results up, and how could you make the schools better, in particular in Bradford? Well, the first thing Solution. you have, the first thing you have to do when you have a problem is acknowledge that you have a problem. Yeah. The people who run Bradford r deny that they have a problem. They say that these league figures don't mean anything. But it's the same league that three years ago they were fifth bottom of. And now they're second bottom of. Mm -hmm. And soon will be bottom of. So whether the league is good or bad, it's the league. You know, God forbid a football team uh, could not uh, claim that it was bottom of the league and the league didn't mean anything. The league does mean something, as any sensible person knows. We are underachieving for a young population that will soon be half of the city under the age of 25. Unless something drastic is done, and very quickly, we'll be stoking up a potential problem for the future. So I launched this demand for a Bradford challenge. It's now been taken up by Imran Hussein, who may or may not be the Member of Parliament next door in Bradford East come the general election. If he is the MP, I look forward to working with him in demanding the resources and the changes that are required. It's called the Bradford Challenge because there was a London challenge. Could I just take a quick break? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> no, I, I talk too much, sorry. <laughs> sorry, we have to go for these breaks. <laughs> All right, uh, it's been nice talking with uh, Mr. Uh, George Galloway. So could you, we just take a quick break here and then we'll come to uh, the last part of our program and we'll see you inshallah shortly after the break.
We welcome you back uh, after the break, um, Nazreen. Uh, what is actually that when we talk on the Bradford schooling and the crimes and everything, we don't have much time to discuss that with Mr. Uh, George Galway about the crimes and things. But the, what we're looking at here, um, I've been raising this point with all the um, all the candidates for the parliament. Uh, the basically, we with the people of Bradford are looking for a solution. Right, they know the problem is there and is hurting their children, and they want the solution. So I'll ask to <clears throat> Judge Galway, what is the solution to all? The solution this? is what happened in London, Tower Hamlets in East London, where I was the MP for five years, has transformed its schools. They're in the top twenty in the country, and we're second bottom. Their demographic is exactly the same as ours, almost to the percentage point. The demographic of a uh, large number of immigrants, a large number of households where English is not the first language spoken, and so on. If they can do it in Tower Hamlets, we can do it in Bradford. And it's not a question of money. It's a question of management, of style, of technique, of a plan to transform the schools. So I say, let's transplant the London challenge to Bradford. And I'm now getting somewhere. After three years of pushing this, I'm now getting somewhere on that. We should hire the people and the methods who transformed schools in Tower Hamlets and transport it up the M1 to Bradford. I'm quite confident that we can pull this off because it's not that the people of Bradford are stupid. It's that they're being let down by the school system and those who run it. <clears throat> what do you think about the, the, the role of the parents and the teachers uh, in, in, in this situation? It starts in the home. Mm -hmm. Our people have got to uh, encourage more reading in particular. We're making some progress in Bradford on that, but not enough. There was recently uh, a national scheme around the National Book Day uh, where people had to read five library books over the course of their summer holiday. More Bradford children entered it this year than before and more completed it this year than before. Uh, in fact, our improvement was the best in the country, but it's still very low. Only half of the kids volunteered to do the project, and only half of those actually completed it. That's reading five books. Now, that responsibility lies with the parents. When I used to ask my father, God rest his soul, a question, he would say, look it up in the encyclopedia. Well, now you don't need to go to the shelf and pick up a big, heavy encyclopedia. You can do it on your telephone or on the computer. You can look it up just like that. That's what our uh, parents have to be doing uh, with their children. Um, of course, the challenges in areas where there are a high number of people for whom English is not the first language are considerable. But they've done it in Tower Hamlet successfully. We can do it in Bradford. All right, okay. So there is a solution. We can do it. <clears throat> There's a lot of people that are suffering in that. Uh, right, we, just moving on to, we're going, going back to just one more question on that. Uh, how do you, looking at uh, your position right now, there is a, um, a council election, there were some sort of problems, some of your, um, <clears throat> some of your uh, councillors, they resigned. Mm. Well, some of them are coming back. Uh, right. You'll get a surprise in the next uh, week or two uh, about that. Uh, this happens in politics. Pakistani viewers know this very well. There's a whole lot of lota going on, mm -hmm. and we have our lotas uh, as much as uh, others uh, do. But I'm confident that we're going to win at least five seats in May on the council, and we might win seven or eight. Uh, that will concentrate the mind wonderfully because any independent councillor sitting there will be drawn back into the fold, in my opinion, because a group of 10 or more would become a very significant force in the city. Unless I can get councillors working alongside me, uh, then what I can achieve is reduced. I'll still do what I do. I do it well. I think I do it the best. Uh, but I can achieve much more if I have a good block of councillors in the city hall working with me. <clears throat> Some of your critics, uh, they're, they're saying you're not as much in the constituency as you're supposed to be in. Is that? Well, uh, self-evidently that's not true. As I've been discussing with you, my mm -hmm. weekly surgery, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can't be in your constituency more than mm -hmm. weekly. 
Uh, Parliament is you're in very much, Are you very much involved with your people there? Uh, yeah, your very much, yeah. very, very much. But I must be in Parliament, of course, yeah. in the week, and I'm in Bradford at the weekends, every weekend. So this is just a lie. Right. <clears throat> right, we're going to that, uh, uh, that issue has been coming in the media last, last few days uh, about the Bradri. Ah, right. Yes. Mm. Bradri is, uh, I mean, originally, if you look at the Bradri concept, Bradri concept is a, such a beautiful concept um, uh, where the people help each other. If somebody's struggling financially and if there's a marriage is breaking up or something, the Bradri gets together and that's what they resolve the issue. That's why the concept of the Bradri and now is been coming in the media for a negative news. How yeah. are you looking at it? Well, it's part of the witch hunt against Muslims. Uh, it's uh, grooming today, it's terrorism tomorrow, it's uh, freedom of speech the next day, it's bradery the day after that. It's just another stick to beat the immigrant population with. There are lots of bradery amongst the English people. David Cameron was a member of a bradery called the Bullingdon Club, the sons of multi-millionaires at the uh, Oxford Union. Uh, there are Freemason braderies. There are religious braderies. Uh, everybody has braderies. It's a beautiful concept, as you say. It's not Islamic, per se. Uh, it comes from the subcontinent. Culture. Uh, Indians have <laughs> bradery also. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a beautiful uh, concept. There's nothing wrong with bradery. What is wrong is where it's used in politics to cheat the people of the best candidate. And that has happened in some places at some time, uh, but less and less. More and more of the Pakistani origin population in Britain was born here. Now their children are born here. Uh, where, which village in Mirpur their grandfather came from will always be important, but it's less important than whether that or this person is the best person for the job. And whilst, no doubt, being a part of a bradery will still be a factor. It cannot be the predominant factor. The predominant factor must be, is that person the best person for the job? <clears throat> you, going back by election, you received a huge response, huge welcome um, in Bradford. Uh, uh, without any bradery, you, you don't have any bradery. I was against the bradery, yes. You're against the bradery. And uh, how do you see that? Your personal experience, you know, as, as being a, in Bradford, you're not from any bradery, anything? No, uh, I'm from the Mac bradery, the Scottish uh, bradery. Uh, no, uh, but uh, I think that many of the members of the bradery will vote for me this time because they know me now and I'm not contesting against somebody from the brother, at least not uh, directly. My opponent in the by-election was a part of a powerful brother. That's not the case this time. So I'm sure I'll get some votes this time that I didn't get uh, last time. Uh, and I'm conscious that joining in an attack on the brother is actually helping those who are attacking the Muslims, attacking the immigrants, attacking the Pakistanis. That's why I don't do it. I mean, in the last program, I had uh, one of the longest serving councillor from Bradford and his Ladmir as well, Gazanfar Khalik. And uh, he wasn't happy the way it was, uh, the candidate was selected, right, the last candidate of uh, Labour was selected yeah. in Bradford. You have to be and careful now because we, by the time you go out, there might be another candidate, who knows? He believes, uh, he believes that democratically it should be, the thing should be different if, if it's, a, uh, you know, it's a real democracy. Sure, that's my point, that the best person for the job yeah. should get the votes. Of course, one has to respect culture and tradition and family and extended family, clan, relationships and so on. These are, as you say, for the reasons you mentioned, uh, very precious things. So they're basically social security networks so that uh, people in hard times can be helped. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, and that's uh, what Freemasons would say uh, is the justification for their brothery. I don't myself accept that, but that's what they would uh, say. That's why I say we oughtn't to allow the media and other uh, people with an agenda to just add it to the charge sheet against the Muslims. I'm confident, just as last time, people, even if 
anyone in any Bradri told them to vote for my opponents uh, for reasons of Bradri politics, that they would not do so. That's how I won last time. I won against the grain. I won against the influence of the Bradri. But that will not be a factor in the Bradford West by in the Bradford West general election. Right, I need to go for another break here, okay. and then we'll come into the last part of the okay. program. <clears throat> right, um, uh, uh, viewers, will you just take a quick break here, and then we'll come back from the breaks. And I've got I've got a couple. I've got quite a lot of issues actually. Well, we're just covering two more um, things from uh, here, and inshallah, we'll see you, see you shortly after the break. Assalamu alaikum Nazreen, welcome you back after the break and uh, I have got Mr. Judge Galway in the studio today and uh, we are talking, we have covered quite a lot of issues here and I would request him um, to come again in the Mind My program before the election. Inshallah. Uh, right, and uh, <clears throat> just going to the um, youngster in Bradford, uh, have you done something for them in the in, in last uh, Well, I've tried to organize them. Uh, yeah so that they don't fall prey mm -hmm. to extremism. I've said to them on things like Gaza last summer, I know that you're angry, you're right to be angry, and the most effective way to be angry is to unite with others democratically to bring pressure to bear on our government and on the powerful in our society. In that sense, we act as an antidote to extremism. Uh, there are places where extremism may be more powerful than it is in Bradford. We have a huge Muslim population, but we have five out of five white MPs. It turns out we even have a Jewish council leader revealed at the weekend in a, in a New York magazine. None of us knew that David Green, the leader of the Bradford City Council, was Jewish. And we have no problem with him being Jewish. In fact, it's the only thing that we don't dislike about him. Uh, so, a city that has five out of five white MPs and a Jewish council leader can hardly be a hive of extremist uh, or sectarian uh, politics. And uh, that's partly uh, because us and others have campaigned for unity amongst the people, against the bad and for the good. Uh, so we have a very high number of young people in our party. Uh, the great majority of the people in respect are way younger than me, some of them younger than some of my children. Uh, and we're giving them a political uh, focus. We're fighting for better schools for them for three years alone, now being joined by others. We're fighting the obscene levels of youth unemployment. That's what I was in coming to you. Is, 50 percent of yeah. our young people are unemployed. So maybe got unemployment. It's yeah. uh, it's a, yeah. a national scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, yet the council and the government have been unmovable. That's why we need a new council. That's why we need a new government. Uh, they have not recognised the warning that I have been giving them repeatedly, that having half of your population as youngsters could be a blessing or it could be the opposite of a blessing. If they have no decent education and they have no jobs, it's an accident waiting to happen. I mean, we, we can help, like, like yourself in that constituency, uh, particularly in Bradford, there's a big number of youngsters there to bring call centers back to Bradford. So there's these educated people there, they're just jobless, so many of them, the girls and boys. Well, we don't just have 50% youth unemployment, we have underemployment. People with qualifications, sometimes even with a degree, serving cigarettes in a, in a corner shop, rather than pursuing the uh, trades, professions that their education uh, has befitted them to do. And we're not, you know, obviously Westfield's going to make a difference. It will produce a few thousand jobs. It will bring a few hundred thousand people into the city to shop and stop hundreds of thousands of people making shopping trips just to, to quick, Leeds. Yeah, just a quick one on that. When you discuss the uh, 
Westfield, obviously Westfield will bring a lot of things, as you said yourself mm. just now. <clears throat> and uh, I was speaking to the, the businesses on the other side of the town, and uh, they have got a fear. Uh, I mean, this, there's all the, all the footfall will divert to the mm. Westfield. Mm. And what's, what's going to happen? To, is there any solid plan you see the council has for the businesses on the other side of the town? Because they have uh, a fear there. Yeah, uh, in White Abbey Road and elsewhere, there is this fear. Mm. Uh, I'll do everything I can to obviate it. I don't run the city, of course. I'm one of only five MPs, and we don't run the city council. Uh, but I think their fears are misplaced. Here's my take, and you can have me back a year from now, inshallah, and see if I'm right. I believe that bringing huge numbers of people into Bradford will help everybody. I believe that all boats will rise. Uh, Asian people who come from far afield to visit Westfield will also visit White Abbey Road, will also shop in predominantly Asian, mainly Asian garment uh, traders uh, elsewhere in the city. That's what I believe. And the people can get involved in the, in the culture activities. Yeah, you could, and many you could promote yourself, could promote well, some culture activities uh, uh, of the people. We have a people plan for a culture yeah. quarter yeah. Uh, with the university, the college, both world famous institutions. Yeah the new Odeon, the reborn Odeon, that was falling down when I arrived, the National Media Museum, and Little Germany, which is an architectural treasure in the heart of the center of It's Bradford. been dead for a while. It's been dead. We can make this uh, a culture quarter. We are a world city. There was a program, remember, Make Bradford British. We're already British. We want to make Bradford a world city. We have within it all these cultures, all these languages, all this cuisine, all this uh, folklore, all the art and craft and culture from all these civilizations, all these societies, we can locate them J just, in the Just, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my program. Unfortunately, just, yeah. j j just a quick one. Would, there are lots of youngsters watching your program is now as well. Uh, your message to them? My message is get involved. Uh, you can't opt out of the political scene because if the good people don't vote, the bad people will vote and will take the prize. And they will then determine the quality of your schools, whether you get a job at the end of your education, whether you can get into university without uh, having a huge debt hanging around your neck for the rest of your life, whether your roads can be repaired. Bradford's full of potholes, as you probably know. Uh, whether street lighting is good enough, whether the school, hospital, clinic, uh, and so on are up to the standard that they should be. And a point we never had time to get to. There's a big danger to halal and, yeah, for that matter, to maybe kosher. Next, next program maybe. Be better, yeah. There's a real danger. There, there, there's powerful forces at work to I try did, and I, make... I did five programs on that. Yeah, yeah well, you, in that case, would, your viewers already know. Yeah. It's a very clear and present danger that we'll have to be politically organized if we're going to uh, re re repel it, if we're going to fight it off. Because otherwise, life would become untenable for Muslims and Jews in Britain. Imagine that in the name of animal rights, the rights, precious, fundamental rights of a substantial section of human beings will be taken away from So me. how good sport do you have? Just a quick one in the parliament on this issue, halal issue. Just we, a quick we, one. On that's this. a good one. Good yeah. point. We have to make the widest possible alliance with the Jewish population, first of all, and with others who recognize that human rights come first and the rights of people to eat food prepared the way they want it to be prepared trumps all other. Thank you very much, Mr. George Gullivan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for Thanks your time. So much. And Thank we'll you. have you again before the election. Rai Nazreen, you have heard all the things, sorry, I'm just going to do it now, just a little bit. Sorry, you have heard all the things that George Galvez has listened to in today's program here in the program. And inshallah, we'll try to invite him again before the election. So those issues that are left, we'll talk about them too. And the halal food issue, like Mr. George Galvez has mentioned it. Mm, we really need to talk on that and inshallah next time. And um, thank you very much everybody being with us today.